I have the great pleasure to introduce Wendy Ross. Um, she's a PhD candidate in psychology at Kingston University, London. Her PhD project is assessing the role of serendipity in creative problem solving, but she's interested in the broader relationship between creativity and serendipity, and how both emerge from rich, situated interactions with people and things. The floor is yours. Um, hi, I am talking about my micro serendipity in the creative process. I don't think, unfortunately, what I'm presenting is going to be novel in any way because I've come up with about 10 points in which somebody's made the point that I'm going to make already over the course of only nine presentations up to this point. So I suspect that what I'm saying might not be new to anybody, but potentially the framework I'm going to use might be new. I want to start off by asking the question that lots of people have asked. I'm not even going to attempt to answer it because there are people in this audience that are far more qualified than me. But I just want to remind the people that this image of the isolated creative thinker, the person that sits on their own, that is a statue that doesn't move, is being questioned from several different research angles. And it's from that questioning point of view that my own research is located. And instead, we talk now about a distributed creativity, that creativity can be seen as being dynamic, as moving between people and moving between things, and very much focusing on the situated individual, the situated person during their, during their creative moments. And so I would argue that when we create, we move from the world of the individual's head to a world that's populated by people and by material objects. Because if, we're still, if it still remains in our heads and its imagination, it's only by being practical and being involved in the system that we become real creativity. So it's moving from an open, from a closed, sorry, to an open system. And further or more then, my argument is, if we are really going to take the role of the environment and other people seriously, which I think we're progressing to do as a research community, then that also involves a parallel reassessment of creative agency. It's not enough just to say the person is situated, it's also looking then at the facets of that environment that create the process, the creative product, with and alongside the person. Now, one of the things that comes up an awful lot when you read the literature and that people have touched upon in almost every presentation already this morning is this role of luck. When Chitsi Mahali interviewed all his massive, eminent creatives, creatives, cre creators, let's call them that, um, this is what he said. He wrote, when we ask creative persons what explains their success, one of the most frequent answers, perhaps the most frequent one, was that they were lucky. Being in the right place at the right time is an almost universal explanation. And that was his conclusion from his series of interviews. And knowing my audience, obviously, um, though Todd has gone, um, looking at Vlad's paper, um, Todd's paper, Marion's paper, where they interviewed the creative artists across five different domains, again, up came this idea of accidents, of luck, and of chance. So they said a designer's creative activity is a game of happy accidents. Accidents play also a role in this process, and they are artistically interesting to have. Objects very often change the original plan, and they're stronger than the creator, and they impose their own rules. Agency shifts in their analysis from the person doing the creating to the material world that surrounds it. So why don't we look at it closer? Okay, well, there's one a very much a methodological and ontological position, which is that psychology often ignores these things that are escape prediction, escape control. And I think we're all aware of that, and we operate within that paradigm, and that's just the way we are. The second problem is also unique to creativity, and Vlad brought it up just now, and actually James's presentation answered it more than I think Vlad allowed, because Vlad, very much the meaningfulness is important to creativity. It's important that the product is meaningful, and it's not just random chaos, which is exactly what James said. He said you can't have chaos in creativity. That's not creativity, it's just chaos. So in fact, actually, luck and accident aren't what we're looking for. It's not luck and accident that are what we need to put into our models. And if we take another one of Chitsi Mahali's interviews with Vera Ruba, now, I don't claim to understand the science behind what she was doing. She was looking at something astronomical, potentially, I don't know, the, the path of Chiron, the comet's tail, as he went across the sky, I'm not too sure. But what happened was she had two spectral images, and she looked at them, she played with them, and as she says, I was so lucky. I looked at them, put them together by accident, and out popped this image, and I understood it all. Okay? Chizzy Mahali reframes it like this. He says, 
As is the case of many discoveries, this one was not planned. It was an accidental discovery. But it was only possible because she could use this luck only because she had for years been deeply involved with the small details of the movements of the stars. If you showed me those spectral analyses, I'd have no idea what's going on. Okay, so the, it wasn't the luck that drove the activity, but neither was it her own personal attributes. Instead, it was a combination of the two. And this is where I suggest the framework of serendipity becomes important. And within serendipity studies, it's very clear that it's not luck. Those people that talk about serendipity as being good fortune, they're not fully comprehending or understanding the concept as it exists. Instead, serendipity lies at the intersection of chance and wisdom. It is a combination of the luck in the environment and the person that then uses and capitalizes on that luck. So it is the process of human agents and external environments that converge and they facilitate a new discovery. Famously, it's an original 1754 definition. It was a combination of accident and sagacity. Both parts are necessary for serendipity to occur. And this is the model, and I didn't realize that I wouldn't be able to point to you, so you're gonna to have to look at where I'm pointing. Um, this is a model that comes from a series of blog posts on serendipity, pulled out from a different V. Rubin, actually not Vera Rubin, which is odd, Victoria actually. And she describes serendipity in a model which is actually very similar to one I saw earlier about creativity. And she talks about the prepared mind, the act of noticing, and chance. These three facets of serendipity come together, they're surprise, there's a fortuitous outcome, and it is recast as serendipity. Now, you're all creativity researchers. I'm fairly certain you're sitting there going, well, <laughs> this looks quite a lot like creativity <laughs> as we see it. Um, when they study serendipity, it proceeds from this mainly a posteriori position. You have to have it recast as a narrative. So serendipity can only exist in the past. And so methodologies of serendipity currently have two main ways of doing it. Semi-structured interviews and collections of reports, case study reports, massive collections. There's um, a gentleman who has just, like, his name escapes me, Robert Merton, a whole house of case studies of serendipity. Boxes and boxes and boxes. He's passed away and someone else has carried on analoguing these moments of serendipity. These moments of serendipity that are stories that people have told, stories that people have sent in. Currently, within serendipity study, there is no models that draw their evidence from experimental designs or observation in situ, and that don't privilege the interpretation of people who experience the event. So, really, it's not really that surprising, is it, that Serendipity says that serendipity has to happen in somebody's narration when the only way we study serendipity is through somebody's narration. We're all very aware, because we're all scientists here, that our understanding of the ontology of any phenomenon is only as good as the methods we use to measure that phenomenon. And serendipity has suffered from exactly the same problems as sometimes creativity does and as other various complex um, phenomena. So I want to go back to this model, and I want to focus only on that facet C, chance. And I would like to recharacterize chance as being when creative agency is transferred to the environment. And I don't know if you can read, I can't, so I suspect you can't, I know what it says. But actually it talks about a perceived lack of control in the chance facet. That's how people experience chance. And that to me is a strong indicator that that's when they're no longer in control, so they no longer have full agency over what is happening. When you have that moment when chance is transferred to your material world, when agency is transferred to the material world, this moment of chance, but then you capitalize on it because you notice it and you are prepared, then you have an emergent co-agency. Something happens which is beyond the environment and beyond the person and is instead truly relational. I believe, and I have, I have started to do so, it's possible to identify these moments both in the lab and outside of it in, in so-called real world cognition. How do we do that? Well, and this, this is where I'm gonna go back to remind myself exactly who talked about it. And we put our participants in a materially rich environment like Bo did, where we're getting them to interact with things so that we can trace their thought process through what they're actually doing 
through the moments and the model we're doing. We do detailed interaction, deep qualitative interaction analysis like Sylvia did. We can slowly pin down the moments, we can pin down the process, and we allow them to have those childlike explorations of their environment, just like Julia was talking about. Because by those childlike explorations, then the chance of serendipity becomes much more obvious, and it's much more reflective of how we proceed in the real world. And what we like to characterise it within my lab is a move from second-order problem-solving, when you give people abstracted problems, to first-order problem-solving, when the people are embedded in a materially rich world. From that moment, you can see how serendipity happens. And what does that look like? Well, this is a study we're doing at the moment on problem-solving in pairs in a materially rich world. Uh, those of you that know anything about insight problems know that insight is accompanied by an aha moment. And the way we categorise that aha moment is we ask people through self-report, did you have an aha moment? I don't think we need to ask either of those two people if they had an aha moment. I also don't think we need to ask them where the aha moment came because we can see it between the two of them. The pointing, the smile, the eye contact. Oh no, I didn't want to even risk a video when it was like this, because I thought it would d destroy everything. But on the video, it becomes very clear that this emerges between the two of them. So actually, by doing lab-based studies, by doing problem-solving studies, but by putting them in this materially rich and this person-rich environment, we can actually start to trace where those moments of co-agency arise. Or we can do detailed case studies, and it's a shame that Michael couldn't be here today because I wanted to talk to him more about this. Really detailed case studies that are the moment of making, the process of making. And we're currently working on a project with, you, again, you can't see very well, unfortunately, with an eye tracker and the process of making them. What happens here is the scraper destroys part of the rim of the sculpture that's being made but the eye tracking allows us to see it hasn't been noticed. And eventually, as you go through the thing, that particular moment changes and shapes the sculpture that's there. It's used and taken into the artistic process, but it's not, it, it is also an accident. So the two things need to combine. So finally, basically, it's this concept of micro-serendipity I want to look at. I want to Look at the, find the moments in a creative process when agency is distributed, when you can no longer say it was the environment that did that, nor can you say it was the person. Instead, material agency and human agency converge to this one moment. Now, these moments might be pivotal, or they might be trivial. We don't know, because we've taken them out of the temporal narr narration. We just know that they happen at that moment. And once we can identify them, then we can start to look at how important they are to the overall product and also to the direction of the process. It also avoids these problems of intentionality. It avoids the problems of meaningfulness. It avoids the problems of chaos. It allows us to think about luck and to take it into our creative models without also saying that things are random or chaotic. They're not. Chance, when it's capitalized on by a person, is not random or chaotic. It is still meaningful. It's just relational. And I always like to end on this because people will say, well, why? Why are you doing it? A lot of people have said to me, why are you, why are you devoting your life to this? And I'm angry, and Stefan said it better than I ever can, which is that serendipity is an important part of our lives. If you ever go into serendipity research, you will find out that people want to talk to you, mainly to tell you how they met their partner. And um, that comes up an awful lot. Um, but generally, they want to talk to you because it is an important part of our lives. But we have no idea how to understand it. And so I don't believe the complex nature of the phenomenon should prevent us from gaining a better understanding of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Questions? One back. No? OK. <laughs> that was just an amazing talk. You, there are no more questions left. So, <laughs> um, For me, it was a, a very new space. Uh, I asked you, why serendipity? Um, and yeah, I, I, I like how you've kind of made it all about the emergent properties. And do you, um, do you intend to look at how to even look at emergence? Yes, yeah, that's, I, I think... I think emergence, and, and it's really nice because Bem has talked to me about and directed me in some of the ways that people have, can look at this and theorize this. Emergence is massively complicated, um, obviously. It, um, it stems from complexity theory, so it would be weird if it wasn't. But I think it is, it is trying to find that moment of emergence and, that, and that, the, the moments that are irreducible that are really going to be really important as we take this field forward. 
If you are even vaguely interested, we have a conference. Those of you that haven't spoken to me personally today, we have a conference at the, um, at the start of September, and lovely people came to visit that because it is cool and it is fun. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Unless somebody else wants to ask a question based on that. Yes, great. Let's go over it. <laughs> are you familiar with uh, Karen Mitchell's uh, out of San Francisco State University. She has a book called Designing the Future, and it moved into a book called Happenstance. Okay. And she took the past in a method to get your continuity, to find your wisdom and your values that guide your design of your future. And once you design it, she says, take a step in the direction of that future and be open to the surprises that come. And that is potentially uh, the chaos that you were mentioning. I think there's a designing chaos, we just didn't recognize it yet. And it's that awareness that you're gonna see a surprise and open to it that ultimately leads you in the direction of your vision. I, 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 do know, I think it'd be lovely if openness to experience um, correlates in any way with serendipitous moments. And um, people have really tried to make it. Um, most of the serendipity researchers, we really want it to correlate. Um, actually, the empirical evidence is that the openness from that point of view isn't actually a key trait. It's, yeah. it, it's being prepared, having a prepared mind, which, does, which allies with what's happening with the problem that you're having, not necessarily a personality trait. Um, and a lot of studies now moving away from it from openness as being the, yeah. the main driver behind serendipity. And that's what she says, you take prepared. your stance, but then you wait for something to happen, something's gonna happen yeah. on the stance, and that's a new word for serendipity in my mind. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that anyway, but to do with, um, have you got any ideas of how to look at the micro instances, I suppose, apart from, say, video, is that one way of classifying it? Um, I think, at the moment, yeah, video analysis is the only way that we can do it, and, 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 it's, and it's been incredibly rich. Unfortunately, I haven't had time to show you all the instances, but there, it's been incredibly rich in ver the various studies that we're doing, and now in a very sort of post hoc way, looking back over other things with video, to see these moments arise almost constantly when something happens in the environment, the person notices it. What's most interesting, actually, is the number of times things happen in the environment and the person totally ignores it, um, which, is, which is itself and it, it's probably an entirely new phenomenon. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I'd like to now introduce Marion Botella, probably needs no introduction, but there we are. She's the Assistant Professor in Differential Psychology at the University of Paris Descartes. After defending her thesis describing how emotions are involved in the artistic creative process, she was postdoctoral researcher at the Université Catholique de Louvain. Belgium, where she examined the impact of creativity on mood. Since 2013, she is conducting her research within the LATI. Her research focuses on um, the creative process in various domains like art, science and design, um, alexithymia and effective traits of creators, and the development and construction of scales. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to talk about um, the creative process and especially on the dynamic of the creative process. Everybody in the room are familiar about the definition of creativity, of course, and the proposition of uh, Giovanni to add the term potential in the definition of creativity and to consider uh, the creativity as a dynamic phenomenon. And the idea today is to... Uh, to propose the way to observe this dynamic of the creative process. Uh, we previously proposed a um, creative process report diary for adults uh, to observe the dynamic of the creative process, but how can we observe that in pupils? Uh, the diary has a big advantage to, uh, cons to, to preserve ecological validity because it can be used directly in the class. Very quickly, concerning the adult version, uh, we list stages of the creative process based on the interview with Vlad, for example. We made a lot of interviews. And uh, we have uh, some kind of list here with all the stages of the creative process. And uh, because I'm working with Todd also, uh, we proposed in a second part a list of multivariate factors involved in the creative process. But you can realize that this kind of list, it's impossible for pupils. So we proposed to picture the stages and the factors involved in the creative process. 
For that, we worked with a professional designer in interaction with the research team, and we proposed a superhero. Uh, we tried to equ uh, equilibrate between uh, boys and girls, and sometimes some characters are not determined. We have many, many colors for skin, for hair, for clothes, and so on. And contrary to uh, this kind of uh, character here, they have a very discreet smile. Here, for example, of uh, four stages of the creative process, here you have the documentation with uh, a boy uh, looking in uh, books or uh, searching in internet. You can find uh, the inside, the illumination with uh, uh, the idea coming uh, to the conscience. Um, the experimentation stages here uh, with modeling clay, for example, and organization when uh, the a boy plan an idea, one, two, three, uh, design here uh, the step to, to realize. Concerning the multivariate factor, we include only uh, most important multivariate factors found in the literature review. For example, uh, some pupils ask for help. They are perfectionists, and uh, as, uh, as you know, I'm working also on emotional factors, so you have here enjoyments, doubts, and anger, for example, of pictures. I will present you an example of observation with uh, the space project. It's a specific context because it uh, happens in Switzerland uh, in uh, a course uh, um, called uh, Creative and Manual Activities. And here, pupils have to create uh, stuff, artifact design. It's between art and uh, design. Here we have a complete class of 16 pupils between 10 and 11, and we have to create something. I will talk just later. And uh, they complete the diary about 20 stages of the creative process and 20 multivariate factors. Concerning the task in itself, pupils had five lessons here. In first, they have to build a character from space with Bonneling Claw. Here you can see a first sketchy and uh, the final production uh, for uh, the character. They also have to write a storyboard uh, for this character with an initial situation, a change situation, and a last uh, surprising uh, event at the end when the situation uh, changes. It's not all. During the five lessons, also, pupils have to realize an exposition of the character. Here you can see an example. And they have to realize a movie with the character in five lessons. <laughs> it's okay. It's working. And happy ending. They will be friends for life. <laughs> OK. Uh, at each lesson, uh, pupils are also to check the stages and the factors they use during uh, each lesson. Uh, Todd uh, present this morning all the trace we can do with uh, the diary. I'm going to present other things because uh, you know the, the trace of the process. And here, just for example, we can extract the most and less frequent stages of the process. If you look uh, at lesson one, you can see that the, one of the most frequent stages uh, is documentation, but uh, at lesson three, four, and five, it's less important to uh, document. Uh, in contrast, association is not important at lesson one, but uh, will be more marked by uh, pupils uh, from lesson four, three to uh, lesson five. Uh, we find also a very uh, important uh, stage that uh, is insight, and uh, pupils does not indicate abandon an idea on a part of an idea. Sometimes at the end, they more abandon a part of, uh, of their idea. 
The, the diary allowed to um, observe the dynamic of the stages, for example, for documentation. A uh, lot of people um, indicate documentation in the first lesson, but it decreases across time. And uh, concerning constraints, for example, it's more important in lesson one and in lesson uh, four, less in the other one. Associative thinking uh, increased across time to be marked by all the pupils in lesson four. And experimentation does not fluctuate across time, it's very uh, stable. We can do the same with the multivariate factors. The good news is that uh, almost pupils feel a lot of enjoyment during the project. Uh, everyone is happy in lesson three, it's great. And we can see that uh, we've, pupils don't feel a lot of negative emotions like fear, anger, frustration, and sadness here in this kind of project. They feel a little more of surprise here. And also uh, we see that uh, pupils had to communicate a lot with uh, the other people in the class and they work in team to integrate all the characters uh, present in, um, proposed by the other pupils. Um, also we need a lot of knowledge, obviously, to create and the pupils indicate that in their creative process. And in lesson one, we have a lot of multivariate factors indicated here. Again, concerning the dynamic of the factor, uh, perseverance, for example, uh, does not fluctuate a lot during uh, the project. Uh, for example, two, uh, patience was more important in lesson one, decrease a little, but um, grow uh, in lesson four. Be intuitive was not very frequent around, uh, across the project, uh, a little more in lesson one. And working team, as we say, increase across uh, time to be more important uh, from the song free at the end of the project. Here, uh, it's just idea because we haven't tested that for, for yet, but uh, I expect to present you some results in the next uh, MIC conference. <laughs> Um, but um, from the, uh, the teacher and from the pupils, we have really interesting qualitative data, interesting to uh, show the improvement of the creative process based on the observation uh, with the diary. First, um, the diary uh, introduced changes in the teacher's practices. It's uh, allow a moment of reflection with pupils on how they create and it improves uh, probably the understanding of the creative potential, for example. As we saw, uh, emotions are very important to create and uh, teachers generally don't touch emotion, but it's really important to work on emotion on positive emotion, obviously, but on all emotion to uh, manage that because they are pupils and they are so young to manage correctly their emotions. Uh, again, it's a specific context of Switzerland, so uh, it's technical and uh, professional gesture to improve uh, the creative process. For example, in lesson one, teacher encourage uh, the search uh, through uh, photos and books, for example. In lesson five, uh, pupils were invited to assess their idea uh, compared to the other production. And also, uh, we hope uh, that uh, observation of the creative process and this dynamic will encourage risk taking because our pupils uh, see all the, the possible stages and all the possible factors involved in the creative process. And um, also, uh, teachers say that um, the impact seems not only uh, uh, limited to uh, creative and manual activities. Uh, sometimes the learning process uh, could be uh, touched in uh, French class, uh, English class, math class, and so on. <laughs> so it can be used in other class and creativity um, classroom. We hope that the diary can help um, the practices in the classroom to uh, explicitly focus on creativity uh, thinking, to provide opportunity for pupils to uh, be more autonomous in uh, their creative process, to uh, be aware about the environmental factors in which they evolve, 
and uh, to provide opportunities to uh, develop imagination and uh, in their own learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes? Oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Marion. Very interesting. In our experience, what we see when we teach in primary school, for example, we see that those pupils that normally are at the bottom of the class, in this kind of experience, they come out to the top. Have you, have you seen anything like that in your experience? Uh, yes, the pupils uh, uh, say to the teacher it was a really impressive experience to, to fill the diary and to, to reflect about their own creative process. And uh, when they go out of the class, they say, oh, OK, with you, uh, I learned to think about what they do and, um, and uh, about uh, all, uh, all I'm learning. So uh, I think it can be a, uh, a tool to improve the learning and the teaching in, uh, in the other way. One at the back. Let's see whether we can do this. Should we meet in the middle? Let's do it. Hello. Um, it's very interesting, it's really interesting what I heard. You know, what, the, what I was thinking while listening to it, is it just a method of writing down what you're doing, or is it, or is it being used as a method for self-regulation of your creative uh, process? In the sense, you know, we ju you ju have you come up with uh, adaptive-like uh, processes and maladaptive processes, you know, which ones lead to good-like results and not uh, to good results? Can you, can you direct them through those uh, diaries that they keep? You know, these are the things that were coming in my mind while, uh, while watching you, so, you know. Here, uh, we, we did not assess the performance at the end of the task. We do not want to, um, uh, to show that people that uh, we have a, a better path to be creative. Uh, we just think, uh, because I'm a differential psychologist, um, that uh, the pupils have to find their own creative process and um, to learn about that. And um, by my experience with uh, artists and expert artists, uh, they developed um, uh, a good creative process when they have a lot of experiences. So uh, we hope to help pupils to start to think about what they are doing to in to, to try to improve uh, the impact of uh, the experience of the creative process. Do you give any feedback? No. No. No more. Can I, I can try. <laughs> can I ask on top of that, actually? Um, so you know you said it's a dynamic process, and obviously things are not just going in one direction. And added to that emotional complexity, which you sort of just touched upon, do you have any ideas as how to allow that back and forth to happen, and how, how could there sort of the teaching be varied in order to allow for variance in emotions or you know, enable it or encourage it or help in case it goes negative? Um, from experiences, um, the first uh, stages of the creative process are more negative, not in this example, but uh, starting a project is very uh, exciting, but also uh, difficult because you have no idea where you are going. And uh, the idea is to help teacher to uh, manage this kind of emotion because it's normal to feel that. But um, for pupils, it's hard to understand that uh, their thinning are normal, so uh, we can help that. One more question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> May I now welcome to the stage as things are being sorted out. Um, am I saying your name right one more time? Ingun. Yeah. Yay, I got it right. Ingun Johan Ness? Yes. All right. She is the senior researcher and cluster leader at Slate Center, Faculty of Psychology, University of Bergen. Ness conducts research on interdisciplinary learning, creativity, innovation, and leadership in both education and work settings using sociocultural theories. She has several publications in international journals and handbooks, and is co-editor in several international journals, for instance, a special issue in the Creativity Research Journal. 
Thank you. Buonasera. Okay, so I'll stop start my clock because it's only 12 minutes and it's so fast. Okay, so just to start with giving you an instant overview of what is going to happen, this presentation is actually about how dialogue and how polyphony, which is sort of a multivoicedness, actually can enable creative knowledge processes in school, in the classroom, but also in higher education. This presentation is also based on a um, study. It was actually my PhD study back in 2012 to 16, which was on creative knowledge processes and how these were facilitated in interdisciplinary groups in organizations. So when I was doing this, I was also doing like duty work at university. I was teaching students of pedagogy and they come came from different departments, so they were also sort of interdisciplinary. So the findings from the organizations made me wonder if I indeed could transfer some of these insights from the creativity in the organization groups onto teaching of interdisciplinary groups in my you know, University of Bergen. So, one of the main purposes of an education system, whether it's in Italy or Norway or France, I believe is to prepare the young ones, pupils, students for the future. And the future is rather uncertain because we know that there will be changes in work life, we are facing some serious social challenges, and thus, that's why there is a need for creativity, there is a need for interdisciplinary solutions. And in Norway, my country, there is a new curriculum coming now and creativity and interdisciplinarity is actually strongly emphasized. But in order to teach for creativity, you know, we need to know a little bit about what creativity is. So I'm not going to repeat what <laughs> so many people have been saying today, but it's about creating something new, something useful perhaps. And also it's about combining existing knowledge in new ways. And as creativity researchers, we often divide between mini C, little C, big C. Mini C, we create a personal new knowledge, a new insight. The little C is about possibility thinking. And Vlad talks about possibility. Anna Kraft talked about it. So many other people talk about it too. But this, I believe, is the core of the little c creativity because this involves the question, what if? The big C, as James talked about a lot, we, you know, it's society level. This is the breakthroughs, innovations. We can call it the elite definition, I suppose, of creativity. And for those who come up with something that makes a difference in the world. But the thing is, we need that everyday creativity. We need these questions, what if, in order to get to that big C. So this is why I believe that in the classroom, in the higher education, we need also to pay attention to these processes, the little C, the creative knowledge processes. So then the question is, what kind of theoretical framework exists out there that can support lecturers at university or teachers in the classroom in their didactical choices if the aim indeed is to teach in ways that can stimulate or enable creative knowledge processes. The what if questions. And being social cultural, I believe in dialogic pedagogy. There are certain principles involved in dialogic pedagogy. There is an emphasis on social interaction. We talk a lot about dialogue. So many of us here have talked about or know about Bakhtin. And dialogue involves many speakers, a variety of perspectives, and truth. Truth becomes something that we discuss, something that we negotiate, that we debate. It does not pre-exist. And we believe that new knowledge actually arises in that tension, in that friction between the voices, between the different perspectives. I like the word polyphony for so many reasons. 
of course, the musical term, but also Bakhtin talks about this sort of multi-voicedness. The, the thing is that no voice is dominating, and there is a simultaneity of different points of views and voices. So, in my PhD study, I took these principles in dialogic pedagogy, and I sort of explored them in authentic groups in organizations. Something has happened. University of Bergen is covering my research question. <laughs> what characterizes the creative knowledge processes in interdisciplinary groups working with developing innovative ideas? And I had three groups. I went there every Monday. I video recorded. I transcribed a lot for two years. So I had a lot of data. And in order to save time, we are just jumping to the findings, some of them, because I found that creativity was closely connected to how they used knowledge. They needed knowledge, basic, you know, top experience, as thinking tools in their idea development. Also, that these new ideas did not happen individually or in a vacuum, but through tension, through dialogue, and through changes of perspective. And then something else was really, really crucial the relational conditions, because creativity did not happen automatically. So the group members needed openness, curiosity, and respect, because in interdisciplinary groups, there will be disagreement, so respect. Also, I found that there was some kind of orchestration going on, that these creative knowledge process seemed to be orchestrated through some phases. And even though I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step model now, it doesn't mean that it always is like that. So, I'm just showing you this because I will move on, but the first phase was about initiation. Then knowledge distribution. Everyone said something about the task, the challenge. Polyphony, they started to discuss. Imagination, they started to ask what if questions and learn from each other. And then in the idea formulation, the ideas became more and more concrete before they consolidated. And of course, this looks neat and it didn't always happen like this, but it's a way of understanding the process. And then I started to wonder. Because in my student groups, I started to see, wow, there are similarities. So. Could I support such creative knowledge processes in my student groups? Could I actually also try to organize my teaching of the seminars based on a similar phase model with different steps and activities? So that's why I tried to transfer some of these insights from one context to the other context. And the similarities, for instance, in both groups, in both the working groups and in the student groups, we had people with different voices. You know, different understandings, different personalities, different culture. And this is how I ended up with what I call the step phase model. And this is a way to visualize how I structured the seminars through phases. And very quickly, the start phase, informing the students about the lesson, but also the intentions behind the activity. And I really stressed the rules for communication, because what I had learned from the organization groups was that, well, you know, people seem to argue a lot, so we need to have someone who listens. It's important to listen. It's important also to ask questions and not just talk in statements because so often we just tell people what we know. And also openness, curiosity, and respect. So in the theoretical part, since in the organization groups, the, the knowledge was so important, I thought that, OK, let the students present selected parts of the course literature to each other. And in this way, the knowledge became thinking tools. In the example phase, this was quite interesting because now we started to see the practical implications of the theory. And I wanted the individual students to you know, come up with something from their perspective. And in this way, the diversity 
became quite explicit and the discussions took quite unexpected turns. And then my favorite phase, polyphony. Because now we started to have some serious fun. You know, we played, we had group activities. I wanted everyone to participate. And we had open questions. We had what if questions. We played with dialogue game. We played with different group roles. You know, intention is to take another perspective. And I wanted them to, you know, do this in order to stimulate their imagination. And also, again, we still kept on practicing to listen, be open and respectful. So one of the students said, I enjoy being the challenger the most. I could disagree, disagree a lot then. That was a way of using my imagination too, you know. It's hard, you know, to be like the one bringing new thoughts. Sometimes I surprised myself too, that I could do that, being the one who opened up a new window. But I could do it since what the other said made me think differently. I like that. And then reflection. Very important as a teacher or as a lecturer, because now we reflected on what, what, you know, what had the, the students learned and how could they use it. But also, how had they learned this? And the relational interaction in the group. And the last phase is the evaluation phase. Feedback to the teacher. What did the students find useful, less useful? Did they reach the learning goal? But also, and I think this is the most interesting, what else did they learn? Did they learn to listen, to seek understanding, you know, different perspectives? Did we manage to practice creative knowledge processes? What if? And also to communicate with openness, curiosity, and respect. So the takeaways, the face model. There are circular things happening, and this is just meant as an inspiration, or one way to structure dialogic teaching. Also, I find polyphony like a very, very apt and very good concept from the social cultural theory, because this is about how diversity can stimulate creativity. And also that to face difference, to actually see difference as a resource for the imagination and to learn to think and to ask these questions, what if the little c? And I believe that dialogic teaching is, well, it can create an arena where students can practice these creative knowledge processes, this sort of possibility thinking. And I do think that we can do that at all levels of the education system. So, more reading for those who are interested. Vlad, you are part of one here too. So, thank you. Amazing, thank you. Um, are there any questions? It's hot and people want to have coffee. <laughs> there is also that. <laughs> um, I just wrote loads of notes instead of asking like questionable it's notes. It's like serendipity, <laughs> serendipity, polyphony. I mean, we have all these words. <laughs> you particularly like the polyphonic phase I of, of the dialogical state. Can I you do. tell me why? Because polyphony is all about you know, bringing together different perspectives and to have that sort of no dominating voice, there is something beautiful with that. And you see like a shift because you say it begins with tension. So is there a way yeah. of facilitating it into that sort of harmony? Yeah, I think so. Because you can try to, for instance, interdisciplinary groups, there are already. And what I found in the working groups was that there was also different roles involved. There was a challenger, driver, radical, control. So it was, was sort of um, tension between different group roles. And it was interesting because they shifted. So e even though some of us might be more, you know, that we enjoy being the challenger the most, and then if you have to, if someone else is being too much of a challenger, you sort of shift. So. And is this something you facilitated that sort of role Yes, shift? you can have that uh, process awareness. Wendy wants to say something. Yes. <laughs> 
Actually, I was going to ask pretty much that question, which yeah. is I know from your research that the people took on the roles. Yes. And I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me, did you then give those roles to the students and say, now it's your turn to be a challenger? Yeah. Or did no. they then identify them afterwards? Well, I, I told them, of course, about my research. And I sort of asked them, should we, should we, do, you know, should we do something like this here? And this was uh, Statoil or Equinor, so they thought, oh, this sounds fun. So I told them about different roles in the groups, and we, we sort of played with these existing roles, but also they, you know, they could do other things. But I think one of the voices here, one of the students, when he said that he enjoyed being the challenger the most, was that he felt that so often it was difficult to disagree, because it felt like, oh, it, we should play nicely now. And then it, it was okay, it was safe, so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so with your experience with teachers, do they actually appreciate polyphony in the, in, in the classroom? Because <laughs> I could expect that it's, it's difficult, or how can we help them to appreciate this? Yeah. You have some thought on this? How can we do that? I, th I think we should ask the, the audience, because I think it's easy to say, yes, we appreciate diversity and we want creativity and we don't want chaos. And so often it becomes sort of chaotic if, if everyone is supposed to, you know, just... So, what can we do? I don't have the solution, but it would be interesting to, you know, to discuss. Does anyone have any ideas? Are we going to sing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It was really awesome to see that this work is being done. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the mission of Norway. And these Scandinavian countries seem so advanced in, in looking at creativity in a, you know, from diverse angles and trying to bring together all of these domains of knowledge. How do they feel about, and um, what is the government doing about the central role of creative thinking. I think, I think what we see in Norway and perhaps in UK and, and in many, many other countries is that we talk a lot about creativity and we seem to, well, some of the teachers really, they ask what is creativity? How can we uh, operationalize it? How can we, how can we teach creativity? How can we do this? And in Norway, now with the new curriculum coming, uh, there is a lot of talk about 21st century skills, you know, employability. And so there is a new focus on it. And it, it might be good, I, I don't know. But um, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of positive, yeah. And also, you know, the fact that uh, there, there will be more deep learning. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, focus on more deep learning and yeah. stuff. So, and then that connects nicely, I think, with creativity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingen. Thank you.